terminologies and architecture that we will be looking into it in next couple of slides. So the first comes with distributed system. You know, we all know that we are working in multi multiple distributed systems environments like every uh, model has been deployed on different physical machines instead on single machine. So uh, whenever the IT industry moving up the globally uh, within the business, so they want to distribute you know, the, the strategy has come up in such a way to make the resources that they rely on should be distributed but not to have a dependency on an existing or any one resource. So the distributed systems comes into picture when you have multiple resources, resources I mean to say you can talk about any hardware, software that will be residing on any physical machines. Even that physical machines locates in different global zones, different areas I mean to say. So when we talk about distributed systems, that is nothing but to, you know, that's nothing but uh, dividing the work among several independent modules. The failure of single module has less impact on overall system. Moreover, to say the you know uh, the system to have more availability, scalability, and maintainability. So this is the main part where uh, the industry has been rolling out in, in recent days, and uh, to make sure our platform, the software that we are running is under middleware and uh, middleware is one of the resource capability area where you have the hosting of the applications, maintaining of the applications comes into picture. So within this distributed systems, our middleware resource is part of it. And uh, when you talk about uh, architecture uh, in the distributed systems, you might be having one tier, two tier, three tier, more than you know, n tier as well. Uh, the tier here is nothing but you having different uh, you know, client modules which would be connecting to uh, uh, various resources which could be middleware or an, a firewall or it comes with a hardware load balancer or uh, which comes with even uh, a database even if you have two tier which would directly interact between two resources, then database comes into picture, entire when you have client, server, as well as database, then it comes up three tier and multiple tiers again. Multiple tiers comes up where, some, where uh, something like when you have client interacting with web servers or web containers, again that would be pushing to uh, load balancers, from there that could be pushing to uh, application servers, from there it might turn to database. So even this aggregation would really depend on the architecture within your organization. So your architecture would be the right persons to judge what should be the architecture that need to be maintained for certain applications. So if I was moreover to say the architecture would be defined based on the criticality of the application as well. Assume that if you're working or if your organization has a banking level applications like I can give you example as uh, any Bank of America, in any site, any website, any banking website. So that kind of websites are being rolled out on internet, worldwide network. So in that scenario, this would be exposed to every client who access who will be on internet. So in that scenario, uh, the banking site would have a different kind of architecture before actually comes, you know, when the client request actually comes to its own network, its own local network, like what I mean to say, whenever from your system, when you take bankofamerica.com, it, from within internet, it will roll out to different routers, from there it will be moving to load balancers, post that when it's trying to hit to a particular web server or firewall of the bank of network, or bank of America, local network, it would route to a different layers, you know, layers again I'm, I mean to say application layer, transportation layer, data link layer, generic, generic uh, uh, network layer I'm talking about. So when the uh, within the uh, worldwide network, so this would be really uh, being, uh, this would be uh, coming to picture when the Bank of America network comes into picture 
to categorize the different client requests. Again, locally within Bank of America network, that would be defined, you know, that would be derived or the forward, the route would be done from the file load balancers to multiple web servers. Again, that would be pushed to application servers and the database. So the whole scenario, the whole scenario comes into picture when you have uh, the architecture being defined in such a way to handle multiple requests and the capability of each resource is really huge to make sure all the requests from the global internet would be really been successfully responded to the request that been raised. So the architecture is the main uh, important part that you guys need to know before you work on any of the product or any of the application related stuff. So coming into our uh, own terminologies, let's go with G2V specific and move to uh, web logic. So this is what a distributed systems and when you come up with a G2V standard and uh, G2V standard is nothing but the enterprise edition that helps to uh, overcome, uh, overcome uh, distribution liabilities. Again distributed liabilities is nothing but wherein the support to the distributed environments comes into picture wherein the development would be done at various categories. Okay. So the standard, there would be certain standards from GTU that we need to follow. Some, you know, something like the applications wherein the you know, enterprise archive, web archive or Java archive that would be really used to make sure your application is being binded up to follow the standards of G2E and the Java. So uh, there are certain guidelines that you need to follow. Um, so that's, this is purely uh, maintained by the Java developers who really write up the code and they would really follow the standards they need to follow in fact to say because when they need to really work on this product, the WebLogic server product, they really need to know the kind of applications that they are, that they are, they are developing it should be compatible to the servers. And every server will have their own respective platform product specific and the platform specific file descriptors that they need to follow. So that the reason moreover to say the developers are and really need to know the capabilities of this application server before they start developing the uh, application server. And moreover to say and uh, JCP, uh, JCP is nothing but Java community process. This is an organization where you know, where I'm saying where the Java is really binded with and the, 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 the development that really happens purely on the directions of JCP. So whatever they develop in Java, assume that right now we are in the market of Java 1.7 and uh, something around in the next six months we will be getting up Java 1.8. So what are the differences that comes up from 1.7 to 1.8 and what are the new features that are going to be embedded by the Java community is what they, they, this process or this organization would really focus and uh, this is the links that you can really look into what exactly the JCP is and uh, the organization expectations how the Java need to be built on and moreover to say yeah let's see this Java enterprise edition architecture again this follows by this is this is the same architecture that would be followed by any of the application server not only weblogic server any of the application server would really follow this jtv app architecture to, to make sure their applications and the code would be compatible to the java applications that been built by the developers okay if you see the left side uh, the color with blue is a client application the kind client applications can be anything you know a simple applet application can also be a client application that would be interacting with a particular server. You may also think of web clients or the web clients is nothing but any application that being deployed on the server would be accessed on browsers. So IE or Firefox or Chrome. And the client applications. Client applications also you can say something like a McAfee, McAfee client that you install on your local machines would interact to the servers would interact with its McAfee server which is being deployed on any of the application server that would really send the server code updates for its uh, client application. So these are the client applications and the middle tier, the middle way, middle tier right now we are seeing is nothing but the where we have Oracle web logic server. That's nothing but a J2E application server. 
has its own again its own standardized with based on the java support to various modules something like if you see the containers you know the basic two are the container the web container and the ejb container are the two major containers which formulates an application server so when we have these two containers in our in our middle tier is nothing but an application server which would serve their based on their capabilities so if you see the web container it would it would serve the request and the response would be done based on the you know, client request we you know with the servlets and jsp more or to say and any any enterprise applications built on ejbs would be served by the ejb container so these two containers would interact with various services if you see in the middle tier the lower level of the screen you would be seeing uh, various services that's part of support with the G, java e certain you can say as jndi jas uh, jas is used for uh, authentication and authorization service jmx messaging extensions jms messaging service jdbc any database connectivity jta transactions rmi remote method invocation and web services these are the different services that was been available by any application server to support with your containers and the middle tier when interact with other tier the other tier the last tier can be any of the services here you can see the database any of the directory uh, services nothing but an ldap or core bus services again it could be another java application that's been deployed on any other server and the messaging queue here it talks about ibm messaging queue and the web services so these all the services that would be interacting these three tasks makes up an entire architecture based on the java standards so this is i have certain you know, uh, definitions uh, where i was talking about earlier where uh, our containers the middle tier contains two containers i was talking about web container and ejb container so the web container would be handled by the java servlets so just these are these are just an uh, a definitions that i just want to uh, highlight okay uh, so yeah so the definition itself says it's you know serverless is a java program that executes on the server accepting client request and generating dynamic response so that's purely on the uh, http response and uh, request and response code would be uh, delivered and say would be created by the java servlets to make sure our application servers or the web servers or the web containers should respond to the request that been received okay so similarly jsps again these are html documents that are in the own with java so again the servlets and the jsp basically been built for any uh, response a question response request and response that would be delivered between client and application server okay next would be the ejb this ejb is nothing but enterprise java beans that would be really been served by ejb container within application server again these are distributed components written in java programming language provide the uh, distributable uh, and deployable business services a uh, business logic is really been built on ejbs so that ejb has been deployed on the web logic server so there are different versions again for ejb support because uh, for every web logic or any of the application server and jdk versions is really been should be really been have compatible to the respective ejb specifications again if you see uh, oracle web logic server 1031 supports the ejb 3.0 specification so if you talk about ejb 2.0 2.1 specifications that would be supported by the previous versions of web logic server so we need to also see the capabilities and to make sure the respective application been built on to have certain standards that to be compatible with so you need to also consult it on the compatibilities of the java standards that we are following 
and next would be the JDBC connectivity. JDBC is one of the service that I have showed you on the architecture that comes up in entire, uh, so one of the tire of the JDBC database. So when you try to connect to that database, you need to see a unit uh, that really being called up by the application servers to make sure there is in connectivity to the database for any transaction level. So this is this JDBC is one of the service and it's a standard Java interface for accessing heterogeneous databases. Again, you might know you might be having question that database database is also being recent databases have a rack cluster. Right. So rack cluster again that's again the category of the database administration that comes into picture wherein they would really know what how what and how uh, uh, that would be comes into picture and uh, how would be in capability to handle the request. So we are really not bothered bothered about uh, the database, but we are really concentrated to make sure that successful call to the database should happen from the service that we have in the application server. Okay, and uh, the specification that defined four drivers types for connecting the database. Again, the Java, the Sun provides. Uh, and Sun has its own drivers to make sure to have a successful call by using drivers. And uh, there are certain drivers being provided by the Oracle, by the vendor specific drivers as well. You have Sun specific and you have Oracle specific. So the, the majorly being used is a type 4 driver being provided by the Oracle vendor itself to make sure to have a successful call to the database and that driver specification need to be used within the application servers to have the JDBC service to have a successful call to the database. And moreover to say uh, the database I'm talking about it can be any database for, uh, we can talk about Oracle which is 80% of the market being used. And we have a, a DB2, we have SQL server and moreover to say again you need to have, you need, you need to really look into the vendor specific uh, documentation to make sure which uh, database they have been, uh, which drivers they have been used in uh, overall uh, uh, while using within the application server. And uh, JNDI, uh, Java Naming and uh, Directory Interface, again this is one of the service being used within the uh, uh, application server. Again it's purely a Java standards and it's purely built on Java API for accessing naming and directory services and built, you know, built as a layer over DNS, LDAP and so on. So uh, this is purely to make sure you have a naming, direct, naming and directory interface to interact to get the uh, a certain tree level structure that's been residing on the uh, servers. So uh, the point that I need to highlight here is every server Every Java server, not even not only WebLogic server, any of the application server would maintain a JNDI tree for every uh, server specific to make sure that the services that gets registered to that server would be displayed on that JNDI tree to make sure that the replication would happen and the replication contains the JNDI tree replications. So that JNDI naming would really helps in having a pen API calls to different layers. Again, different layers. I mean to say, when you have a JNDI name, the specification being defined for every services. Like example, I can say for JDBC, and the JNDI name would be the main part that would interact or that would help the Java applications to interact with respective resources. And the JNDI tree that I was talking about, this would be the way that would be residing on, and it would be a. Uh, uh, identified with its initial context to make sure to have a successful binding for every object that gets created to interact. And JMS, Java Messaging Service uh, is again a Java standard uh, service that has a Java API calls, and Java API being used for an accessing message oriented material. So when you talk about JMS, you have a JMS coming to picture when you have a service residing on uh, any of the application level within the uh, middleware tier. Assume that an application server has also has capability to maintain a messaging queue, messaging oriented service. If you don't want to depend on any of the application server based for the service, you can also reside on the third party uh, 
messaging products like IBM MQ or Active MQ by Apache. Uh, within this uh, JMS, again, the interface supports point to point domain and publish and subscribe our domain guarantee message. These are again the services being uh, interface being supported by the service that we need to that every application server would really follow the standards. And the JAS. JAS is nothing but a Java authentication and authorization. It's a service again uh, that's been part of as Java you know, Java standards. Uh, that's a Java basic based on the security management framework service being supported. And JAS supports single sign-on and authentication module within uh, the uh, by any other sources like IAM and uh, you know, Oracle uh, OAM OVD. You can see that. And JAS enables flexibility control over authorization, whether it is based on users, groups, and roles. So a JAS really depends to have a flexible control based on the categories that's been uh, specified here, users, groups, and roles. Based on this, JAS would really uh, really works on. And JMX, Java Management Extensions. Again, these extensions are really used uh, to have control over any of the MBN interaction that we do. So the specification describes MBNs which are building blocks of JMX. So the management tool really interacts with MBNs residing on the server with the Java JMX extensions with the use of this. And the client application. Okay, right now we come into the architecture that we really uh, speak, we just spoke uh, some time back. The client applications that I was talking, something like client applications, applets, web service calls, web service client calls that I was uh, talking about, any uh, web client. These calls would really uh, interact with the WLS or any of the application servers uh, through uh, GRMP, this is called a protocol, or T3, IIOP, and JFORM. These are the different protocols that supports based on the Java standards. And T3 is an internal protocol that's within WebLogic that would really interact. And types of client uh, modules are nothing but we have uh, standalone Java applications, applets within a browser. And the web client. A web client is nothing but an inter a web client interacts with any of the application server or the WebLogic server via HTTP using servlets or JSP. So previously we are talking about that. And the type of web clients includes browser and the web services. And uh, when we talk about proxy servers, okay, again if you see here, web client is again different from the proxy servers. Proxy servers has capabilities to uh, forward requests to other machines. If you see the pictorial uh, diagram over here, the client at the left side would hit first to the proxy server if we have in the architecture. That would really make sure to forward to the request to the different servers or it can also act as a load balancer to have an equal resources to be distributed to the other uh, part of the resources. And this proxy server can be used as a level of indirect, indirect and, and security. It can be used to load balance as well. And the reverse, reverse proxy is a web page catchy. We can also use this for this feature as well. And the web server. A proxy server is again different from the web server. Again, you could see the certain similar uh, capabilities like web servers provide uh, web requests served by them and it would communicate via HTTP, FTP and so forth. And can handle CGA request and the proxy uh, some request as well to the application servers. So it has some, some uh, minute level uh, uh, similarities with the proxy server where indeed proxies the uh, request to the application servers before hitting. So for this web servers, uh, if you talk with WebLogic, WebLogic would really give plugins. Uh, this is again a piece of code built on C++ uh, and C and C++ that would be really uh, need to be uh, embedded with the web servers to have the request instead of web server coming to picture, web server to plugin simply come, you know, web server would interact with the plugin code that been derived on it. And that would really interact for the all the HTTP and HTTP requests. And the firewall, you generally might know uh, in the real time uh, 
in your organization the firewall is uh, one of the uh, resource to filter uh, authorization and authentication service and to kill you know help to keep out of hackers map report requests can act as a proxy service can decrease can decrease backend network act activity so it would really filter the request that comes on to the uh, resources on to the other side of the uh, architecture so application servers okay when we're talking about application servers right now it can be not only web logic server it can comes up with an, any of the uh, uh, other products like ibm uh, websphere uh, it comes with a jboss glassfish any of the application servers so every application server is purely java based so it should provide this capability having with you know, web container and ej container talking with and multiple java based services that we are talking about like right? JNDA, JAS, JMX, JMS, JDBC, TA, and RMI and web services. So this provides services that support the execution and availability of deployed applications and handles heavier processing cores than web servers. So web servers can't act as an application server, but application server can act as a web server because the more common container that we have is a web container. So this is a web application server configuration. This is the final architecture that we need to really know uh, how uh, it's been residing so overall. When you see here, the client application would interact with firewall. And that firewall would be residing before it interacts with internet. So when you talk about the firewall at the beginning level, that would might the firewall be, would also exist on your um, local machines as well. So that would really interact with internet and when you go on to beyond of the internet, the vendor specific or the uh, product specific or the organization specific network comes into picture, wherein that would be again protected by the firewall and that firewall would be followed by the web server. Again that would be web server would be followed by the app server and the database that's an internal network with an organization. And this kind of architecture would be uh, followed for any web applications that been deployed on the application servers. This is general, so it is not need not me to say that we need to have mandatory of this kind of architecture. That would really depend on the architects of your organization who really decides what should be the architecture. And if you talk with application server configuration, if you see the difference over here, you don't have web server over here again. So again, I said to you, it's, it's really not mean to have the web server or the application server for a, within your uh, architecture, but it's purely depend on the kind of application that you really depend on. If you, you know, if you have an only web application that really doesn't require an app, app servers as well, then you might be having architecture wherein the web server would, uh, would be the final resource that would uh, come into picture. But whereas if you see the only application server configuration, we don't have web server over here, but this application server, moreover, it, it would uh, interact with multiple application servers. So, the application server to application server would be the major interaction over here. So, that's it with the basic level for now. And uh, let's pitch in with uh, what exactly that we will be learning uh, in the next sessions. I'm just uh, we really have a standard uh, uh, content that we already been shared. Uh, so let's see what are the main points that we'll be uh, talking about for this uh, WebLogic training session. So as I said, the prerequisites is to know uh, the, uh, the basic knowledge of uh, Unix and the basic knowledge of XML and uh, basic knowledge of networking knowledge and as you know major specification uh, I'm sorry, major suggestion would be done uh, if people know java is well and good and uh, if they don't the basic knowledge is required for it to understand the terminologies when we talk about going forward and because when we go ahead in working on the web logic server we would be deploying certain applications those applications are really built on java so that's the reason when we modify the Java applications in our training sessions, you need to really understand the concepts or the patterns that we'll be writing on. So that's the reason 
we recommend people to know the basic knowledge of Java. And the course objective. Okay, what we are expecting, I'm say, what is the objective of this course? Majorly to say, at the time of completion of this course, you should be able to know uh, the description uh, of the architecture of the WebLogic server, uh, domains, servers, machines. These are the you know, uh, topics that we'll be talking within the WebLogic server training sessions, and a basic level again of the product like. Uh, Installations, configuration, troubleshooting. I'm say you all see all these aspects over here, and perform a regular administration uh, functions as well for WebLogic server. And we also learn how to set up a cluster for the servers that we'll be talking about, and the distributed applications and the resources to the cluster. And we also see the configuration with Oracle HTTP server. Uh, that would be really the same pattern of Apache because our HTTP server has been really built based on the uh, Apache itself. So we can, we'll also see a one web server over here as a web tier front in front of the Oracle web logic server. It's just a cluster. And we would be deploying different type of applications and uh, that's purely built on uh, Java specifications onto the web logic server. And we also see how do you monitor. There are different monitoring aspects that we would be doing from uh, GUI level command uh, command line, and also the scripting part. We will be have one WebLS, WLST is a default scripting that we have within WebLogic, same as WL uh, ad, uh, was admin for uh, WebSphere. And uh, we will also see how to deploy and manage large scale applications and its life cycle. And we will also see uh, basic resources like uh, application security and JMS also be part of these training sessions. So we will also look into it and uh, moreover we will also see uh, a high level backup and recovery uh, how do you do when there is a failure exists in your uh, middle tier. Okay, course description. So let's see the detailed uh, description over here right now uh, of the course content, moreover to say. Basically, uh, when we start with the Oracle WebLogic Server product, uh, we'll see the installation of the Oracle WebLogic Server is one of the topics that we'll be starting with to know how, how and when are the basic and the flexibility, the kind of mode that we use to install, like GUI mode command line mode. We also have we also have one more mode called silent mode, which makes sure the uh, feasibility to have and flexibility. Uh, that silent mode also we'll have a look into it when we're working on it. Once we are done, we'll be learning uh, how to see the directory and what exactly the directory structure of the software. Once we are done with that, we'll be working with configuring a simple domain. Again, domain is nothing but an a workspace for any IDE. So that's, it's a kind of similar way. We'll have a space, a domain specific space wherein we'll work around for an Oracle web browser server to be configured. So in the same pattern, we'll configure a simple domain and uh, that domain will be working with different uh, managed servers and admin servers. These are the servers definitions that we would be creating up when we're creating up the domain. And we would understand the direct structure of the domain and also we'll also see how do we manage the domains with WLST. WLST as I said it's a web logic scripting tool. We also have an option to uh, control uh, or to, to evaluate it by the you know, for the domains to uh, create, manage and also uh, create a specific level domain configuration that we'll be seeing from WLST as well. And while creating up the domain we need to make sure a certain level uh, configurations that we need to configure like port numbers and the components that we need to uh, really require when creation of the domains. And we will be seeing creation of the domains using templates. Templates is nothing but and these are the pre-existing templates, domain templates that can be used or also we can create a domain and we can create a template of our own that's called a custom templates and we can use that custom templates to create a domain again. 
once you create the domain, you'll have an uh, admin console. This is again one of the uh, uh, discussion that we need to talk about. It's a good kind of, you know, it's a web-based client console that we can really use to make sure to administer the WebLogic server. The same whatever you do on the WebLogic console can also be you know, monitored or be, can also be used to configure with WSD as well. And the next topic comes up, how do you configure managed servers, how do you configure uh, node managers and the logging level and different logs that helps us to uh, troubleshoot for our web logging server environment. Once you see with that, we will be working with the deployment concepts. The deployment, as I said earlier, we have different kind of applications, extensions, I need to say. So, extension is nothing but extension with the .ear, .uart, .jar. That kind of applications would be deployed on the web logic server. And we will also see how can they can be deployed, how to test on it, how to set the role, uh, when the role comes in, role, I mean to say, role of a web service. When the role of the web service comes into picture, how do you access those applications with the plugins? We all see those patterns. And uh, a deploy, you know, uh, deploying JDB applications. Here, with, when you deploy the JDB applications, we'll be seeing uh, deployment descriptors of a particular specific applications that have been built on. Something like weblogic.xml and web.xml and uh, weblogic application.xml. We don't see the descriptors at that moment during the uh, training session. And the advanced, advanced deployments, and we will also talk about the clustering feature that we have in any of the application server and we will learn how do we do that clustering in uh, web logic servers. And the JMS resources, how do we set up JMS resources and directly, you know, what do you do for configuring, deploying and monitoring general services. And we also see the security concepts as well. How do you configure? How do you protect your web logic server? How do you protect your web application resources? And we also see uh, SSL configuration as well. One way SSL, two way SSL. We'll create certificates. We'll deploy them on the web logic server as well. And at last, we would see the backup and recovery operations. Uh, this is a high level again. Uh, that would be uh, helpful for us to make sure that uh, if any failure occurs we can recover recover uh, from these features that we have. So that's all uh, I have uh, for let me know if you have any questions uh, 